Hello, John Dove here from the Advocacy Club. Uh, we've just had our August session of the Legal Advocacy Club for 2024. And tonight, our members have been undertaking witness handling. So they've had the opportunity to um, undertake some acting, play some witnesses, undertake evidence in chief, and of course, perform some cross-examination. So I'm just going to share some hints and tips now in relation to witness handling. So I'll start with evidence in chief first. So this is, of course, when you're calling your own witness and uh, you're asking them to uh, give their evidence. Some people actually find evidence in chief more difficult uh, and it can be more difficult for a number of reasons. The idea with evidence in chief is that in reality, you shouldn't really be leading. So open questions are the name of the game when it comes to uh, evidence in chief. So as a general rule, think about it like this. Anything that begins with a W or H, who, where, what, when, how, why, they're open questions. They ask the client for an explanation. They ask for a detailed response. They are very much encouraged when it comes to evidence in chief. Now, of course, whilst uh, you shouldn't really be asking leading questions, in reality, what happens in the courtroom is if there's something particularly uncontroversial, you'll normally speak to your opponent beforehand and say, are you happy for me to lead on X, Y, and Z? Streamlines the process rather than you having to sort of um, elicit answers the difficult way, um, if I put it that way. But for, for an exercise like this, and of, of course for your exams, if you're studying, I, I imagine you're probably required to um, try and elicit the information through uh, open questions. Now, at the beginning, you really want to ease the witness in. So the first question you might ask is, please identify yourself, i.e., what is your name? Um, and then you might want to just say something to the witness, something along the lines of, um, well, of course, this is a magistrate's court case, so you'll say, I'm going to take things nice and slowly. I will ask you a series of questions. If you can address your answers towards the magistrates and speak nice and loudly, that would be very helpful. Something like that, just so the witness knows how to answer the questions. And then ease them in with nice, simple questions, you know, sort of setting the scene so they become comfortable for when uh, the evidence becomes more difficult later on. Now, of course, I've mentioned that questions should be open. Now, what I mean by that is that a question shouldn't really imply the answer. So to give an example, let's say I was a witness and somebody was asking me questions and I'm wearing a grey hoodie. So if somebody said, what are you wearing? That's an open question because it doesn't imply the answer. If somebody said to me, you're wearing a grey hoodie, aren't you? That implies the answer. That's a closed question. You shouldn't really be asking that in your evidence in chief, unless, of course, um, you've agreed with your opponent beforehand that you're you're okay to lead on that point. Now, what you can do is you can use what's called a piggybacking technique. Now, that's where a witness may give you an answer, and you can then piggyback off previous answers to sort of take it further forwards. So you might say to the witness, what are you wearing? A hoodie. What color is the hoodie? it's gray. What size is that gray hoodie? It's, you know, whatever, you know, you keep going. So you're using the previous answer from the last question to elicit more information. And it's a good way for you to sort of build upon your answers. And of course, although I've indicated that you, as a general rule, you shouldn't really be implying the answers. Sometimes you may give a witness a multiple choice answer. So you might say, for example, if they were describing an individual, you might say, was that individual small, medium, or tall? Because you've not suggested the answer. You've given them all the various options. So as long as you're not suggesting the answer, a multiple choice answer like that, or a multiple choice question rather, would be fine. So that's evidence in chief. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is you're trying to elicit all the information that's in their witness statement or all the key information so that they can give that as their evidence in court. Then, of course, you've got cross-examination. So that is when you are challenging the other side's witnesses. You're putting your case to those witnesses. Um, and cross-examination um, can be difficult. And whilst I've mentioned some people find evidence in chief more difficult, some people struggle with cross-examination. And I think it's one of those things with cross-examination, particularly when you study it, it can be difficult at first. But what happens is it's like anything else. With practice, at some point it clicks and you get sort of you get a feel for cross-examination and you start to improve at it. It's like anything else. The more you do, the better and the more proficient you have become. So whilst I've been saying that for uh, evidence in chief, it's all about open questions, closed questions are much more important for cross-examination. It allows you to retain control of the witness. 
And quite often, particularly when you're putting your case, a number of your questions may be simply statements with the word, isn't it, at the end, or aren't you, or what have you. So, you know, it could be that you were drunk on that day, weren't you? It was you who st struck the first punch. You're the one who punched him, didn't you? You know, so you put in these answers. So it's basically a series of statements with didn't you, isn't it, etc. at the end. When it comes to cross-examination as well, I think less is more. So it's very tempting to ask that one question too many that destroys your case. When it comes to your cross-examination, when you're preparing it, you always want to think about your closing speech. Think about what is it that you want to say in your closing speech and how does that witness's evidence help, help you? So what do you want to put to the witness? What answers do you want from the witness that will then feed into your closing speech? Once you've either put the questions that you want to put, you have the answers that you want, stop. It's very tempting to ask that one question too many and then it causes problems. And where a lot of people go wrong is when they're trying to ask sort of conclusion re-questions, if I put it that way. So, for example, in this particular scenario, we had our nosy neighbor, didn't we, who sees the punch but doesn't see anything beforehand. And she says that she's sat in her living room for some time. She can hear banging, she can hear the sort of loud music, but doesn't hear anything specifically. So if we can get her to agree all of that, that she's not heard anything specific, and once again, you know, we want her to agree that all she's seen is the punch. She's not seen anything else in the lead up. Great. That's what we need because we can then comment in on that in our closing speech when we're trying to suggest that this is self-defense because we can say, well, look, she's not seen anything beforehand. She's not seen any confrontation. She's not seen anything, anything that was said by either the defendant or the complainant. Whereas if you say to her, the music was loud, you, you know, you weren't present at the time. All you saw was a punch. You don't know whether this was provoked, do you? We don't know what she's going to say. She might have something else up her sleeve that she's going to say that completely kiboshes the case. So um, you need to be very, very careful about asking that one question too many. And the other thing to remember with cross-examination is quite often or almost never, you are not going to get the witness to back down. So even if you tie that witness up in knots, you know, you're going to be suggesting that they're lying, that they're dishonest, that they can't be telling the truth on this occasion. And, you know, you've really tied them down. A witness will always find a way to, to wriggle out and give an answer that's contrary to what you're saying. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter what the witness says in cross-examination. It's just a, about making sure that you're putting your case to them. So don't think that it's all about how am I going to come up with a clever sort of sequence of questions such that there's no way that they can challenge what I'm going to say and they, are, and they have to agree with my point. It's never going to happen. They're always going to try and think of something in the witness box to counter what you're saying. So don't worry if a witness will never back down and agree because quite frankly, they're not going to. It's it's more important that you put your case and then you you, you can fair and squarely put that in your uh, closing speech. So those are just some tips in relation to witness handling. And I uh, hope that has been helpful.